Good everybody. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to talk to you here. Um, I tried to introduce you a little bit to STARS, as already said in the introduction, and therefore I didn't make any speech to have you look at this movie. I don't know if you already saw this, but you're actually looking at the movie. We have a little bit less light here on the podium, that we can see it a bit better. And the lights a bit, because I think then it's better visible that this is actually a movie. So I leave people, everybody looking at it for a moment. Because this is essentially the whole talk. <laughs> but I give an explanation, of course. Seems to be an interesting system. You don't have to see me, you only need to see the. Just click, turn it off. <laughs> That's, that's exactly the, the other lights you should take off. Yeah. And now you have the light on the podium. I would like to have no lights on the podium. Yeah. So this is, was actually the hardest question of the day. You could just look, it's, it's amazing. Yes. I think you can. Yeah, you can. Okay, okay well we do it then as it is. Okay, then, then we leave it at this. I, I don't think we should spend the whole afternoon on two stupid lights. Okay, so um, what you actually see here, and I hope you can then see it, is that this is an image of a star cluster. So what you look here at stars. And what has been done is star clusters are, uh, stars are clustered together. They can move. They can move around each other. And uh, they, they, they can do other things. So this is actually a movie that was taken within one night. So if stars move, you don't see them move over one night. But if you still, you can. If this contains a pointer, I guess, as well. Or am I mistaken? This is a pointer. I have all wait here. Yeah, I found it. So here, for instance, you see this one here? Whoop, there it is. That's gone. There it is again. That's gone. And here you see another one. And there you see another one. And there you see another one. And there another one. There another one. Oh, see? If I now, hopefully, if I point you to it, you can see. Lots of action. And this is all taken over one night. So this means that the star, each of these stars, changes its brightness over the period of one night. And this is not insignificant because you can see it by eye. And this is actually what I will do to, during this talk. So this is the title of my talk, Unraveling Stellar Interiors. And to start out with a little bit of vision, as this is the topic of, uh, of the conference today, um, I want to start with a vision of Arthur, Einstein, uh, Arthur Eddington in 1926 already. In 1926 he said, at first sight it would seem that the deep interior of the sun and stars is less accessible to scientific investigation than any other region of the universe. Our telescope may probe farther and farther into depths of space, but how can we ever obtain certain knowledge of that which is hidden beneath substantial barriers? What appliance can pierce through the outer layers of a star and test the conditions within. How can we do this? How can we look into the star? How can we give you vision into the star and know what's actually happening? What does our sun like in, in, in its interior? Not only the surface, we see the surface uh, on a daily basis, not today, but on, on most days we can. And the answer to this is actually astro-seismology or seism seismology of the star. I mean, we know there are earthquakes, and if there's an earthquake, people do measurements, you feel the, star, the earth is vibrating, and that, that probes deep into the, the, the earth, and we can measure what's there. We can do exactly the same thing with stars. So we have the word astro, well, sorry, seismology is coming from Greek. It's astery is a star, seismo is vibration, shaking, logos is, is reasoning. So actually what we try to do is try through the analysis of stellar oscillations, we try to study the stellar interior. So, 
this is how it works schematically. So what you see here on the left-hand side is a, a star. We, we showed it here as a circle. And then here, all these different rays are actually the oscillations that probe the stars. And you can see that if you have an oscillation, a different ray, it can probe the stars to different depths. Some go very deep, so we can learn something maybe about the core. Some are very shallow, so we can learn something about the surface. Some probe just slightly different depths, so maybe we can learn something about what's in between there. And this has been used already on the sun a lot. Our sun does vibrate, in case you didn't know that. Um, and here we, can, we have a, a schematic picture of what the sun looks like. We didn't know this before that, and, and, and the studies on the sun are about 50 to 60 years old. It's only when we started to know what the sun actually looks like within. So we have here uh, a core, it's a radiative core, uh, around that where, where we burn hydrogen to helium, around that we have a radiative zone and then we have a convection zone. And so most of the stars that have a structure that is similar to this will have similar oscillations that the sun has. So then one of the questions you may have is how do these uh, stars actually oscillate? That's not per se evident. So there are um, a couple of mechanisms uh, that can cause this. And the first one is convective outer layer in which stochastic excitation of oscillation takes place. And if you want to know how this works, you can do an experiment, which you can do at home. You just go, you take some water, you put it on a, in a pan and put it on the stove. You turn on the stove and then you wait. And slowly when the water heats, before it boils, you can hear it. You can close your eyes, you can hear it. It makes this sound. And then the sound goes down and then it starts boiling. And it's in this period where you have this sound before it boils. That is actually the heat that you pump into it and it cools from the top because that's just, just the room temperature causes the noise, causes convection, and then the energy of this convection makes the pot resonate a little bit in its natural resonance. And that's what you hear. That's exactly, only in three dimensions, what happens in the sun. And, then, and for that matter, in any other star that has a convective outer layer. We have this convection that has energy, and that energy can be transported into the global oscillations of a star. And so this is how a star can oscillate. There's a second mechanism, and that was actually, again, I would like to quote Arthur Eddington here. He came up with the idea that if a layer of a star becomes more opaque upon compression, it could hold the energy flowing towards the surface and push the surface layers upward. The expanded layer would become more transparent, the trapped heat could escape, and the layer would fall back. He had this vision in mind, and actually, this is exactly how it works. So what can happen is you have the energy flowing outside. You have a layer of partly ion, a partially ionized layer. There, instead of the, the energy flowing through, it, in this layer, it actually heats up the layer. And so the energy doesn't flow through. By the fact that it heats it up, it traps it, it expands. By the fact that it expands, it cools, and it, energy can flow through. And this is also how stars can oscillate. And then there is a third mechanism and that is the forced oscillations may occur due to tidal effects in closed binaries. Also, this is something you know if you know that the moon um, orbits the Earth and we have the tides. The tides in the sea are actually the tidal effects of the moon on the Earth. And also, if you have two stars that, that circulate each other very closely, then that, this can happen and you can have also oscillations uh, on these stars. Um, what I want to do you now, to tell you now, is a little bit of a more general concept. So I've now explained to you that we have the stars, they oscillate, and I told you how they can oscillate. I will tell you now a little bit what kind of different stars you have, because like with music instruments, if you play one instrument or the other, you can hear the difference. Now we have many, many different stars. Stars get born, they die, so they have a whole life, they have higher, low masses, they are chemically different or can be the same. And so the way we order stars is in, in a so-called Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. This name is just because of the inventors of it, so don't think there's something more behind it. Um, and what we do here, we show stars as a function of temperature. So hot is here on the left, and cool is on the, on the, the right, and uh, cool is red. I don't know if you use the tabs at home, that's completely aphysical. You should have red to be cold and blue to be hot, but somehow Somebody thought of it differently. And then here on the y-axis, we have the luminosity. And that is how bright a star is. And if we just observe stars, 
and we measure their brightnesses, we measure their temperatures, and we put them in this diagram, it has this shape roughly. This is an art, uh, artist impression, but it has this shape. And this has this shape because when stars are born, they follow this line. So the stars that are cooler are, are less massive, and the stars that are hotter are more, uh, sorry, are more massive. So these are all stars here along this line that fuse hydrogen to helium in their cores, but they have a different mass. And that's why they spread out along this line. Uh, along this line. If then the stars evolve, so at some point you run out of hydrogen in the core and you have to do something else. You have to burn the helium maybe. Then if that happens, and that can happen, you become a giant here, or even a super giant. So you get to this part. And then when you're completely running out of fuel, you just die, it's like a candle, it just dies out. And then you end up here in this, you're a white dwarf. So a white dwarf actually doesn't generate energy anymore. It is just gravitational energy, the contraction that lights it up. So this is a path a star would follow throughout the, the, the Hedgepong-Russell diagram, or HR diagram. I hope not to use the abbreviation. Um, and we can, we can, if we look at those stars and we check their oscillations, we can see the differences. So what I want to do now, I want to do something that's a little bit artificial, but it's very nice. Obviously, we observe light. And sound cannot travel through space because it's a vacuum. But from this light, we can transfer this to something that is audible. And I would like you now, if, I hope the technicians uh, all works, like the, you to listen to a few stars and then you can hear the difference. So the first star we uh, start with is our sun. We know the star. The sun is roughly in this diagram placed with this white star. And this is the sound of the sun. in mind. This is the sun. You could hear this is not just a sinusoid, there's several oscillations going on. I will go back to this. The first thing what I now want to do is like you to listen to two stars that are very, very similar to the sun. That's Alpha Sen A and Alpha Sen B. You can see them here. So the sun is here on the left. Alpha Sen A is a tiny bit bigger and Alpha Sen B is a tiny bit smaller. So now first you get Alpha Sen A. And then we have Alpha Sen B, so slightly smaller than the Sun. I mean, I don't know anything about music, but I can hear the difference. The sound these stars make is different. And that is because these stars have a slightly different radius, slightly different size, slightly different mass, and their internal structure is slightly different. So then if we now move on a little bit along this hedgehog whistle diagram, we move to the giants. So now we're here, it's a much bigger star. not bad, isn't it? Uh, and then, just to finish it off, we also listen to a white dwarf. So this is, these are just some examples from stars. They make very different sounds. So, these are very different stars as well, and I, I, I have to say, the giants are my pet stars. So these are the stars that I do research on, um, 
And that's why I will go and tell you today a little bit more about these giants, and what I've done at the giants, and uh, what vision I had in the past, and what I will have, in, will have for the future. Um, so just to say a little bit more about the giants, what happens to a star when they are in a giant phase. Here I have a very schematic view of how stars evolve. So you start here in the left bottom part. So this is a star like the sun. It is burning hydrogen to helium in the core, has a slightly radiative zone around that and a convective zone. As I said already before, at some point you run out of your hydrogen. So what happens? Well, at first case, nothing much happens. Actually, there's no hydrogen burning in the core anymore, but there's hydrogen burning in a shell around an inert helium core. And so you get more this structure, like here, depicted here. So you have a helium core, but actually it's not hot enough to fuse helium yet. And so the only fusion you have is in a shell around it. It's the so-called helium shell burning stage, or the red giant branch stage, we call this. Um, and the star in this stage, the, the, the surface cools, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and at the same time it gets cooler, redder and redder and redder. And you get a huge star. Such a star can be 100 times the sun, for instance, easily. There's no problem with that. And while it does this and evolves, the conditions in the core get very hot. And at some point, you can have helium burning. And this can happen in two different ways, either a very slow process. But if you're, say, below 1.7 solar masses, so maybe, say, two, two times the mass of the sun, it goes fast. It goes very fast. It's in the order of minutes. And if you know st ast astronomical time scales, a minute is really nothing. We usually calculate in millions of years, and even that is, is very short in our time scale. So this happens in minutes, and then it's called also the helium flash. In flash, you have helium core fusion in the core. And so in this case, there's helium fusion to carbon in the core, and there is around that still hydrogen, fu hydrogen to helium fusion because not all the hydrogen is, back, is, is gone, it's only not anymore in the center. So these two stages, this helium core fusion and hydrogen shell fusion, happen essentially, um, uh, happen very fast and, and, and are all called giants. And what happens in this hersprung dorsal diagram that I just showed you before, they actually fall on the same place. So these stars have roughly the same temperatures, at least part of the stage, and the same brightness. So that means that if we do that measurement, we can't distinguish between them. And if we want to study the internal st structure of the star, we want to look into them, we need to know this. And so this is one of the things that I will uh, tell you about. Um, but first of all, I have to tell you a little bit of the story of the history of the, the, the research on this. So the first time that a red giant was found to oscillate was in 2002. It's only 14 years ago. So in 2002, the first oscillations were detected. And everybody said, ooh, cool. And then they looked at theory and they said, how should they oscillate? What kind of shape should it take? And there was not a lot of literature on it, but there was one paper, maybe not looking at exactly the right stars. And they predicted that the star would only oscillate in this manner. So this is a schematic movie of an oscillating star where when it's blue, it expands, and when it's red, it, it, it decreases a little bit the size. And so it's kind of a breathing mode. And so this, tea, this paper... So I think this is a message I want to give in terms of vision of science written in the Enigma. Do not always follow what people predict. It's totally different. Predictions are not first and right. You can look and see if you can test it observationally in the Enigma. Essentially, this is also not only in that book, that is very important. Because if you have only the breathing modes, you can't do a lot. You can't really study the internal structure of the star. But if you have other modes, like I showed you on the right side, you can, if you think back at this picture, you can control this. There's very obvious structure in here. These peaks here at a frequency are oscillation modes. These are the oscillations of the star you just lis listen to. And they have a typical frequency. So this is your, sorry, you see the power here, density here in the y-axis, the frequency, it's in microhertz, whatever that means. Um, but we have some measures here. This new max, what we call it, is kind of the typical frequency at which this occurs. And this is very important, because this gives you an indication of the radius. And you can understand that. If you have, if you have a very big star, say, and you have your wave and you have to travel through it, 
and back, because you have to be observed at the surface, it takes a long time. And so it's a low frequency. But if you are a small star, you're up and down in, in, in no time. And so that has a very long, large frequency, because frequency is one over the time. And so this frequency um, is, say, an hour or so. I just say for, for reference, the sun has a new max of about 3,000, and that's a five-minute period. And so this star is slightly bigger than that. And then you see more things in this star. If I, I zoom in a little bit, you see actually that the pattern that you have here is very regular. You have here one peak, two, one, two, one, two, one. Very regular. And that's very good because the frequency difference between these regular patterns is roughly constant. And it gives you directly a measure of the mean density of the star. So we know roughly what the star is made of. It was hydrogen anyway, we knew that. But because we know the radius roughly and we know the density, we can get the mass of the star. So these are direct measures of a mass and a radius of the star. And now you may think, ah, oh, mass and radius, who cares? Well, in astronomy, you care. How would you otherwise measure a mass and a radius of a star? You can't put it on scales or anything. So this is a very revolutionary method because we can do it much more accurate than has ever been before. Um, you may wonder um, what these numbers are, and I should explain this. This is the number of nodal lines on the surface. So you have seen that sometimes you have these parts of the star with red and part was blue, and it moved in different shapes. The white lines are actually nodal lines, so where the star doesn't move. And this is the number of these nodal lines on the surface. So the zeros have no nodal lines, so these are the breathing modes. One has one nodal line, so there's something like this, and two does something like this. But it's very hard to do with your hands. Um, and you can have more complicated things, and they are probably also there in these stars. But as we observe the star as a point source, we can't see it. So there's one more thing that is of interest, and that is this also between this naught and two. Again, you have a small spacing, and that's also nearly constant. And that is actually sensitive to the core of the star. And if you plot these against each other, so this is the small frequency separation on the y-axis between the naught and two. This is the large frequency separation. This is a measure of the mass, roughly. This is a measure of how much hydrogen you have left in the core. And that determines the age of a star, because the burning is roughly at the same speed, and so you can determine the age of the star. So in this way, we cannot only get the mass, the radius, but also the age of the star. And ages are notoriously different. I mean, even here. I think I, somebody already made the mistake and thought I was a PhD student. Well, I mean, you can make an estimate of my age, but probably not very accurately. And probably not zero and not 60. Um, so this is the star we just looked at. It's called the main sequence star. It is one of these stars that is burning harder than to helium on this long ridge that I showed in the headphone whistle diagram. But this is not my pet star. This is the type of stars that I like. Even more of these peaks. Not even more, many more of these peaks. What are those then? Well, those are very interesting because these peaks, the peaks that we've looked at so far, are actually sensitive to somewhat more the outer layers of the star. These peaks, all these peaks, are also sensitive to what happens in the core. That's where we want to be. That's exactly where we want to be. If you want to study the internal structure of a giant where you have either hydrogen or helium burning in the core or not, that's where you want to have information from. So this is a cartoon artist impression of what we roughly think such a star should look like. So what you see here is, is a big red giant and then the outer layers oscillating and also the core is oscillating. And we can see signatures of that on the surface of the star. This is something I find super exciting. I hope you share that with me. Um, so if we now look at this, and I said that this is sensitive to the core, so this has some importance. So here I give you two examples to show you what we can do with this. And so we have here two, again, these are the Fourier spectra. So we have the frequency here on the x-axis, two different stars. This is, we like to use like large telephone numbers, so these are the numbers with which we indicate these stars. Um, we have again these numbers written here. We have the frequency, power, and here 
you can see we have the new max again, this typical frequency. And of these two stars, one is 100, one is 87. It's not the same, but it's fairly similar. And then we have the delta nu. This is this difference between the frequencies 8.0 and 7.89. It's not the same, but it's fairly similar. Then if we now look at these patterns here of where the 1 is indicated, that is very different. And also there, we can indicate a very typical difference between the modes there. And if we do that, we do that in this case in seconds. And we do that, we have 53 seconds and 96 seconds. You don't have any error bars, but the errors on this are of the order of four or five seconds. This is very significant. And this is because we can probe the core. And if we do this now for a lot of stars, we find two populations, two very distinct populations. You find the blue population here, and these are the stars that are, have no um, helium, uh, helium fusion. And we have these red and orange stars, and the difference between red and orange is just their mass. And they are in the helium fusion state. So this was the very first time that we could distinguish between stars that are either already helium burning or not yet. So this was really a revolution, and it's uh, five years ago that we found this. There are more things if you look more closely into the frequency spectrum. You can see that again here we have, we've now indicated it with squares and triangles. So this is the 0 and 2, and this is 1. But again, we see it split. Some of you may have heard about the Zeeman splitting. This is something like that. Because uh, we saw it a little bit in one of the movies. Stars are not standing. They are rotating, actually. And so because they rotate, they split a little bit. And so that's a signature of their rotation. And so if you, you can see that in this, again, a movie. And so here you see the inclination angle. So this is the angle at which we look. That's indicated. You can see it visually here. So these stars... In some cases, the um, oscillation works, so to say, with the rotation, and in some cases, against the rotation. Um, and then you can see, oh, I think it should move again. Oh. And then you can see that the wavelength changes a little bit. That means the peaks are split. You can also see that depending on the inclination angle, you can see which mode is more dominant, and we can see. So actually, this gives us a probe not only to what the rotation of the star is, but also how we look at the star with respect to its rotation angle, which is, again, of a lot of interest. And why is this of interest? Obviously, this is of interest because we can study the stellar internal structure better, which is personally my biggest interest. But it's also very important for other fields in, um, that can use astroseismology. And one of these fields is the fields of exoplanets. So exoplanets, I don't know if you're up to date with this, probably not. So exoplanets are now a couple of thousand fine. So these are planets that orbit around an other star than our sun. And one of the popular methods, which is uh, used, for instance, also by Kepler, is a transit. So what happens is that a star, uh, the planet passes between us and the star, and in that sense you have a dip in, in your, the brightness of the star. And so when you do that, to get the, the properties of the planet, you need to know the properties of the star. And so astroseismology can be of huge influence on that. And the fact that we found now Earth-like planets with Kepler is because we could do astroseismology and we could determine the radius, and therefore we could do these things. So astroseismology has a wider purpose than only exoplanets. And why do we want to know this, actually? Well, one of the things is I just show here uh, an interesting um, system that we found. So here you have um, the star, um, and in this case, it's an, it, it, this is the line of sight, so this is how we look at it here from the right. We could see two eclipsing planets, so they, they move in front of the star, but actually we found that the rotation axis of the star is in a different direction. If you now look at our own solar system, that's not the case. The sun rotates and the rotation axis of most of the planets maybe not planet nine, uh, are in the same plane. And so this means that this, is a completely, this system is very different from our own solar system. And one of the questions that people want to ask, uh, want to answer, is how did our solar system form? And by finding very differently shaped solar systems, we can find that it, actually our solar system is unique so far. We've not found anything like this. And 
that there has to be a lot of interaction to form the solar system. One of the, the things that we found here was that there's a third companion planet which is probably responsible for this misalignment, a misalignment. But something like that could have happened also. So this is very important to find out how are actually planetary systems formed, which is a, an important question. The other thing, what I'm mostly more interested in, is the Milky Way. So what we know from the Milky Way is mostly through its stars. But if we do not know the stars very well, we do not know the Milky Way very well. And so it's very important that we know and get the stars to much better, higher accuracy. And so this is also one thing that we do with astroseismology, where we now contribute to. Here you see a schematic uh, a picture of, uh, here's the galactic center. Here are we roughly. And these are all kinds of different satellites that probed in different directions and roughly the distance they probe. And so you can see that we can now probe with astroseismology in different directions. And we can study in that way the Milky Way with much higher accuracy. I mean, we can with other instrumentation look farther and deeper but the accuracy of what we obtain from each of the individual stars is much higher if we can also combine this with astroseismology. So what is the future? What is the vision? What, what are we going to do? So there's actually quite an interesting time coming up, up. Yesterday I was in the UK and we had the first data release and a talk about a Gaia mission. The Gaia mission is an, an ESA mission and it's ex essentially it's measuring distances to stars because again, that's very hard to measure. How do you measure distance? You can't just put a, a line there. And so what actually what they, the satellite does, it does the same thing as you do how you measure distance. You have two eyes and that is on purpose because the fact that your eyes have a slightly different perspective makes that you can see three-dimensional and you can estimate the distance. The, the doves do this by moving their heads like this, so they have two different views. And so this is actually what this satellite also does. It has two different planes, and so it observes in two different planes, and it, in that sense it measures distances. And this is the first data release we got uh, this week. But there's much more to come for about a billion stars or so. Um, so that's very interesting, certainly for studying the Milky Way. We finally know how far a star is away. That means we know how absolute brightness is, so we, we can study much more detailed things. And then next year, we will have the TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey uh, Satellite. will be mission. This is uh, a, a, an American mission, and it's a nominal period, it's two years, and it will measure again over the whole, well, it will measure for the whole sky, more or less. It will look at and, and search for exoplanets. But again, we get these measurements that are also excellent for astroseismology, and actually we will combine that. So for the stars for which we find exoplanets, we will also try to do astroseismology and combine and get very accurate uh, parameters for our planets. And then the third satellite, oh, sorry, uh, here, that is Plato, planetary transits, transits and, oscill uh, and oscillations in stars. Somebody told, asked me about acronyms. This is all on purpose. It's called PLATO on purpose. Um, and that is a big mission. Um, actually, um, Germany and also um, the, our Max Planck Institute are highly involved. And that will also measure um, very accurately uh, stars for exoplanets and also doing astroseismology. The launch date is 2024-2025. I think it has already been moved by a year or it should be moved soon because this is what always happens. Um, and then I, I've written here this kind of cryptical 1D through 3D. And that is because observations drive a field, but the modeling and theoretical computation should not be left behind. And in all our models at the moment, a star is one-dimensional. And even if you, you, you are interested in something completely different, I think you can imagine that a star is not one-dimensional. It's a three-dimensional thing. And so there is development ongoing to get more three dimensions, uh, get things with three dimensions. We can now do the upper couple of megameters, which is maybe a few percent of the sun, can be modeled in three dimensions, which is a big improvement. And recently there has been a study, if we want to do, to say, the sun, study that in three dimensions, I um, mean, the computer power that's needed for that is predicted to be present in 60 to 100 years from now. So that will take some time, and this is just expanding the Moore law where they, they say that the computer power increases, doubles every year or so, every five years. Uh, and so only then the computer power is there to do that, certainly not for all the stars. So this is something, this is a development I think that we should really look into 
and uh, see if the modeling can really keep up with what we do on the observational side. So I think the real vision for the future in this field is that we would, uh, we would like to unravel stellar interiors taking into account all physical mechanisms, rotation, something you've seen here, because we have 1D models, we don't include it at all. Convection, we have no clue how to model that, for instance. We know it's there, but we don't know how to model. We don't know, uh, it's not in three dimensions, so uh, we don't know how it interacts with rotation either. Overshoot, if you have a radiative and a convective zone, the convection doesn't stop at a very sharp boundary, not even in our atmosphere. So there's some overshoot. How that works, we have no clue. Magnetism, I didn't even talk about this because I stay away from it. We don't know, we can't see it. But it is there, it must be there, it has to be there. So how do things all work, interact, and how they form and shape a star? And we would like to do that in three dimensions. So I hope in this talk that I give you a little bit of an idea of the power of astroseismology, that is of very much interest, not only for stellar evolution, but also to learn something about the planets, our own solar system, but also others, the formation of it, and of the Milky Way. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for that very interesting talk that I was expecting. It was really great. Um, guys, I really hope <laughs> that was...